move to the next item on our agenda and continue our program today. I now have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. Secretary DeVos was sworn in as the 11th Secretary of Education in February 2017. Throughout her life and her tenure at the Department of Education, Secretary DeVos has been a vocal advocate for religious liberty and freedom of conscience, and she has been a zealous force for eliminating discrimination against all Americans, including Jewish Americans. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate that. And thank you for all being here for this important discussion today. I wish this subject didn't need to be discussed at all. Discrimination against anyone on the basis of their faith or eth ethnicity is always wrong. That we have to repeat that refrain today is troubling. It's even more troubling that too many young people perpetrate that kind of discrimination. This administration is committed to stopping it. We stand firmly against the alarming rise of anti-Semitism. And we acknowledge this reality. Jerusalem is Israel's capital. When President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to, Jer to Jerusalem, it was a historic step toward peace in the region. And peace in the Middle East begins by re recognizing Israel's right to exist. Israel is a light to the region, but we all know it's surrounded by jihadists who embrace evil and who deny Israel's existence and violently work to wipe it off the map. I think of my own visits to the Holy Land. They were indelible experiences that have shaped me in many ways. And visiting my great uncle and aunt in the Netherlands and seeing where they hid dozens of fleeing Jews behind flour sacks in their bakery during the Second World War also impacted me deeply. The atrocities of the Holocaust must never again occur. Never again. This administration is committed to protecting Israel, our strong ally and the Middle East's only democracy. Israel has a committed friend in the White House, and Israel has friends at the U.S. Department of Education. We're so pleased to have Ken Marcus as our Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights and Reed Rubenstein. And Reed Rubenstein as our Acting General Counsel. Many of you know both men and their longtime work against discrimination and anti-Semitism. One of the most pernicious and prevalent examples of anti-Semitism on campus is the campaign known as BDS. These campus bullies claim they stand for human rights, but we all know BDS stands for anti-Semitism. We recently made clear at Williams College that these kinds of efforts are unacceptable. Students there tried to register a pro-Israel group, but after much anti-Semitic uproar, the College Council denied the group recognition. We negotiated a resolution agreement with the college that affords the pro-Israel student group the same rights and privileges as any other student group. There's another issue vis-a-vis -vis Duke and UNC. I recently directed an investigation of a conference there that may have been funded by taxpayers. We're looking at whether the conference violated grant terms and perpetuated anti-Semitism. These are just two examples of what the Department of Education is doing to protect students from discrimination. Discrimination based on actual or perceived shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics. And we are intent on ensuring protection for students across the country. We're committed to our partnership with Attorney General Barr and the Department of Justice on this important issue. I know this discussion will highlight other examples and offer insights on how to continue combating anti-Semitism on America's campuses. Faith is personal, but it doesn't have to be hidden under a bushel basket to recall scripture. Americans have fought and died for the right to live their faith in all aspects of their life. This administration is, and always will be, 
committed to ensuring all believers can live and practice their faith without fear. Thank you. I know this conversation will be useful and important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary DeVos, for those excellent remarks and for your outstanding leadership at the Department of Education and on these important issues. Our next panel is entitled Anti-Semitism on Campus. Our moderator for this panel is Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General Claire McCusker-Murray. The panelists will now join us on the stage. Principal, Associate, Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General Murray rejoined the department in 2019 and currently leads the Office of Associate Attorney General, which, where she oversees several department litigation and policymaking components. She's had a remarkable career at the Department of Justice, at the White House, in private practice, and as a law clerk to both Justice Samuel Alito and then Judge Brett Kavanaugh. She has been a staunch advocate of religious liberty during her time in public service. Claire is uniquely qualified to moderate today's panel. Earlier in life, Claire spent more than her fair share of time on university campuses. She is a proud graduate of Harvard College, Cambridge University, the School for the Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, and last but not least, Yale Law School. Claire, the panel is yours. Thanks so much for that. Ooh. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you for that kind introduction, John. I'm, I'm so honored to be part of today's Countering Anti-Semitism Summit, and in particular, um, I'm so pleased to be moderating this panel on anti-Semitism on campus. Um, it's been widely reported. I think you can't sort of open the news without seeing an article about, uh, you know, a, a student group not being recognized or a student not being given a recommendation to, to study abroad in Israel, that incidents of anti-Semitism on campus are on the rise. Um, at the very least, I think it's fairly clear from the press that Jewish students feel under threat on campus in a way that they haven't in the recent past. Our panel today will be discussing the state of play. Are we really seeing an increase in anti-Semitic sentiment on campus or just a rise in reporting? What form is the new anti-Semitism taking? Um, as well as looking at what's behind any increase in anti-Semitism and what can and should be done in response. That's sort of a lot of ground to cover in 90 minutes, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, Jonathan Tobin is, director in, is, is editor-in-chief of Jewish News Syndicate, where he writes a daily column on domestic poli politics, Israel, and Jewish affairs. He's also a regular contributing columnist to National Review, The New York Post, The Federalist, and Haaretz, among, other, among many other national publications. For many years, Jonathan wrote a column for the Jerusalem Post entitled Views from America. Mr. Tobin is a graduate of Columbia University. Aliza Lewin is co-founder of Lewin & Lewin, a Washington, D.C. litigation law firm. Among her many high-profile cases, in 2014, Ms. Lewin argued before the U.S. Supreme Court in Zivotofsky v. Kerry, the case involving whether an American citizen born in Jerusalem may list Israel as a place of birth on his or her U.S. passport. Ms. Lewin is also president and general counsel of the Lewis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, a nonpartisan advocacy group to advance the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and to promote justice for all. Ms. Lewin is a graduate of NYU Law School and Princeton University. William Jacobson is clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at Cornell Law School. He is also currently a contributor to the Times of Israel, where he blogs about topics related to BDS and bo boycotts of Israel in higher education. Before joining the faculty of Cornell, he spent 23 years in private practice in Providence, Rhode Island, litigating business disputes in the securities industry. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Hamilton College. Charles Asher Small is founding director and president of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy, a New York-based nonprofit committed to fighting antisemitism on the battlefield of ideas. Dr. Small serves on the faculty of Tel Aviv University and is currently a visiting scholar at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. His research focuses on contemporary antisemitism, including the delegitimization of Israel and notions of Jewish peoplehood. Professor Small earned his doctorate from St. Anthony's College, his master's degree from University College London, and his bachelor's degree from McGill University. We'll start by asking each of our panelists to speak for about eight minutes on a topic related to our larger theme. 
After those opening statements, I'll pose a series of questions to our panelists to try to get them in dialogue with one another, another and to ask them to comment on current events. Mr. Tobin, would you like to, to begin? Thank you. It's an honor to be here to discuss how best we can combat anti-Semitism, and it is very encouraging that the Department of Justice has chosen to highlight this issue in this manner, and we thank them for that. It is, of course, a matter of no small irony that college campuses are among the places in this country where anti-Semitic sentiment has become commonplace and Jews feel the most threatened by a culture of intolerance. That institutions that are supposed to be strongholds of independent inquiry and progressive values have become the beachheads on this continent for the spread of what the State Department called a rising tide of anti-Semitism that has been sweeping across the globe is shocking. But for anyone who has paid attention to the academic world in the last generation, it is hardly a surprise. The reason for this boils down to one key fact, the growing popularity of anti-Zionism and the way that ideology has been used to legitimize anti-Semitism and to create a hostile atmosphere in academic circles and on some campuses where Jews feel not only marginalized but also intimidated and threatened. Support for the movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel, BDS, has not only gained a foothold in academia, but in many university departments, opposition to its discriminatory goal and tactics marks both dissident academics and students as pariahs to be shunned, shouted down, or worse, a situation that is particularly threatened to Jews. In this generation, anti-Semitism has taken on a new form in which Israel has become the substitute for anti-Semitic, anti anti-Jewish stereotypes that have been handed down through the ages. In discussing this problem, it's vital that we clarify some popular misconceptions. What is anti-Zionism, and is it, as many of its less honest advocates claim, separate and distinct from hatred of Jews? Anti-Zionism is opposition to a Jewish state and is focused on activism and activism advocacy here in the United States, and terrorism in the Middle East for the elimination of the state of Israel. It means singling out the one Jewish state on the planet for extinction and making it the only existing national political entity of the nearly 200 represented in the United Nations that is the focus of an international movement to erase it from the map and whose birth in a post-war world in which various conflicts gave rise to scores of new nations is considered an original sin which must be reversed. Just as important is to understand that contrary to the rationalizations put forward by BDS advocates and other opponents of Israel, anti-Zionism is not criticism of Israel or of its current government and its policies. More than seven million Israelis wake up every morning and proceed to criticize their government just as more than 300 million Americans wake up every day and do the same about some aspect of their state, local, and federal government. That's life in a democracy. Mere criticism of Israel is not opposition to the existence of Israel, nor is it anti-Semitic, and no responsible person would claim that it is. But when one seeks to deny the Jews the right to a state in their ancient homeland, no matter where its borders might be drawn, to deny legitimacy to their national movement in a way that no other nationalism is delegitimized, to deny them the right not merely to sovereignty, but to the right to live in peace there and the right of self-defense, that is not mere criticism. It is prejudice. That must be the starting point for any discussion of anti-Zionism. What anti-Zionists seek to do is something that is unique to one people and one country. No other people on the planet are treated in this manner or singled out for opprobrium in the way that anti-Zionists speak about and seek to treat the one Jewish state. It is true that not every ethnic group has achieved sovereign status in their homeland throughout the world, but there is no other example of an international movement that is dedicated to eradicating an existing sovereign state predicated on the notion that its population not only has no right to exert power over its territory, but also no right to live in it, as is the case for Jews in Israel. To oppose anti-Zionism and to correctly brand it as a form of anti-Jewish prejudice is not necessarily to espouse a particular point of view about the Middle East peace process. The conflict between Jews and Palestinian Arabs, which has been going on for more than a century, 
is complex. It is hardly surprising that those who criticize Israel's stance on the peace process ignore the fact that Israel has sought several times to offer statehood to the Palestinians in exchange for peace and an end to the conflict, and that the Palestinians rejected it each time. But those who claim that justice is only to be obtained by denying to the Jews the right to statehood over any part of their country, Tel Aviv, Haifa, and not just Jerusalem and the West Bank, over which these two peoples have contended, when they so readily support many other ethnic, national, and religious groups, are practicing a unique kind of bias. Seen in this light, anti-Zionism and its BDS component are not a critique of any Israeli policy or politician, nor is its purpose shifting Israel's borders. Its purpose is, as BDS advocates make abundantly clear in their literature and websites, is to deny the Jews rights that no one thinks of denying to others. And the term of art, as such, it is a form of discrimination. And the term of art for discrimination against Jews is anti-Semitism. While it is possible to make academic critiques of Israel's right to exist that can take on an air of legitimate debate, in practice, on many college campuses as well as elsewhere, Advocacy for anti-Zionism illustrates that it is indistinguishable from traditional forms of anti-Semitism. The arguments from anti-Zionists and their BDS movement raise wish to reverse not merely 71 years of Israeli nationhood, but to erase thousands of years of Jewish history and faith. They single out Israeli actions and judge them not merely by double standards applied to no other democracy, let alone any other Middle East country, but seek to maliciously compare it to Nazi Germany. They treat the one nation that is linked to Judaism as illegitimate while ignoring the connections between faith and dozens of other sovereign nations. The arguments against Israel and particularly its supporters here in the United States are also straight out of the anti-Semitic playbook, including themes about Jews buying power and congressional support and false accusations of, of dual loyalty and committing loathsome crimes. They are rooted in a kind of demonization of Jews that is all too familiar for students of history. That members of Congress, as well as academics and activists, have employed these themes testifies both to the growth of this movement and the unwholesome manner in which it has sought to insinuate its ideas into the national conversation. Moreover, we don't need to look at their literature of the BDS movement to know that anti-Zionists and the BDS movement are steeped in hate. Wherever they raise their banners, on college campuses or anywhere else, anti-Semitic acts, whether in terms of intimidation or even violence, always follow. Now, the hijacking of intersectional ideas in which the struggles of various minorities are seen as linked has enabled some academics and journalists to portray the war against the Jewish state as somehow analogous to the struggle for civil rights in this country. But this false analogy, which seeks to employ the language of human rights in order to legitimize anti-Zionist rhetoric, is rooted in a falsehood. It is those who wish to discriminate against the one Jewish state and its people who are spreading hate, not those who seek to defend Zionism, which is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Those who spread this form of anti-Semitic hate claim they are promoting peace, but their position is actually antithetical to the cause of peace, as well as prejudice, because it seeks an outcome that could only be achieved by a genocidal war against Israel and its people, who will not submit to the overthrow of their democratic state or the ethnic cleansing of their country. And that is true no matter who is spreading this form of hate, whether they are non-Jews or in the case of a small vocal leftist minority, Jews. Seen clearly then, there is no doubt that those whose discourse about Israel is anchored in a movement to destroy it and to demonize its, diaspora, its people and its diaspora Jewish supporters are, are not merely criticizing its government or speaking out in favor of peace or human rights, but engaging in a form of hate that is inherently anti-Semitic. We must proceed from this unavoidable, unavoidable conclusion to state that it must be the policy of the United States and of decent people everywhere to oppose anti-Semitic agitation and violence, whether it labels itself anti-Zionist anti or some other set of ideas that masquerades as progressive 
but is actually practicing one of the oldest form of hatreds. Anti-Zionism is not merely anti-Semitism operating under a new false front, and those who deny this are spreading a big lie. It is imperative that we not only use this summit as a springboard for action against a noxious form of hatred and its troubling reappearance within the lifespans of survivors of the Holocaust, but also to deny its adherents the cloak of legitimacy with which they seek to clothe themselves. That is true on colleges, campuses, or anywhere else, but it is especially important that we not let those who seek to educate or to deny those who go to college the right to do so without being demonized, shunned, or silenced. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this summit. It is a true honor to be included on this illustrious panel. Most people today are able to recognize traditional or classical anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism that we associate with the swastika or with the Nazis. It's more difficult, however, for many to identify anti-Semitism, the type that Jonathan just described, the anti-Semitism that targets Zionism and denies the right of Jewish self-determination. So I'd like to focus a little bit more on that form of anti-Semitism. It's not uncommon today to hear people say, I'm not anti-Jewish, I'm just anti-Zionist. But is that really possible? Is it possible to support Jews but oppose Zionists? The answer is no. Why? Because Zionism is an integral part of Jewish identity. Zionism, the yearning and desire of Jews to exercise their right to self-determination and to reestablish a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel, is an inherent ancestral and ethnic Jewish characteristic. Zionism as a political movement may have originated in the 19th century, but this yearning for Zion, the desire of Jews to return to their ancestral homeland, that is thousands of years old, as old as Abraham and the Bible. To be a Zionist means to support this right of Jewish self-determination in the ancestral homeland of the Jews. If I celebrate the fact that Jews have returned once again to the land of Israel, if I celebrate that the Jewish state of Israel exists, then I am a Zionist. Those who oppose Zionism deny Jews this right. Judea Pearl, the father of the late journalist Daniel Pearl, has coined a term for this. He calls it Zionophobia, an irrational fear or hatred of a homeland for the Jewish people. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA definition of anti-Semitism, includes as an example of anti-Semitism, and I quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, close quote. The IRA definition recognizes that Zionophobia, denying this fundamental core Jewish belief, is de facto anti-Semitism. My maternal grandmother was a sixth generation Jerusalemite. Her ancestors came to live in Jerusalem in the early 1800s, not because there was some modern state of Israel, but out of this deep sense that, if, that as Jews, that was their home. This yearning for Zion is the glue that has kept Jews together for millennia. For centuries, Jews have not only prayed facing Jerusalem, but they have prayed to return to Jerusalem. The Shana Haba'a Birushalayim, next year in Jerusalem, is heard each year at the Passover Seder and again at the conclusion of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Do you know that over half of the 613 commandments in the Pentateuch relate to the land of Israel and can only be fulfilled in the land of Israel? The Jews' connection to the land is so strong that for thousands of years, wherever Jews have lived, they have prayed for rain, not where they reside, but for rain in the land of Israel. But Zionism, this essential component of Jewish identity, is now under attack. 
Those who deny Jews the right to self-determination, who say Jews do not have a right to a Jewish state in any borders in the land of Israel, their criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic even if it is cloaked in human rights terminology. Because if you do not believe the Jewish state of Israel has a right to exist, then your criticism, criticism of Israel is not intended to reform the policies of the government of Israel. It is intended to destroy the Jewish state. To accurately identify anti-Semitism masquerading as anti-Zionism, we must learn to distinguish between the Zionophobes, those who oppose a homeland for the Jewish people and seek to destroy the Jewish state on the one hand, and those who genuinely seek coexistence between Jew and Arab on the other. Groups like Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace, who believe that the Jews have no right to self-determination, no right to a Jewish state, are not interested in dialogue or compromise. Their goal is elimination. Make no mistake about it, what is happening today on campuses and beyond is part of an organized, well-funded strategy to marginalize pro-Israel Zionists and deny them a place in society. When Students for Justice in Palestine, an organization supported by American Muslims for Palestine, held its annual conference last November at UCLA, they posted their goals on the conference, for the conference on their website. One goal described SJP's attitude towards Zionism. Goal number two, which was titled, and I quote, re-gearing from mythos to action, said, quote, the aim of this theme is to remind us that Zionism is not an insurmountable force. We know that Zionism is ethnic cleansing, destruction, mass expulsion, apartheid, and death, close quote. The goal went on to say that, quote, the reason we can have hope is that Zionism is a human ideology and a set of laws that have been challenged and can be destroyed. This is a reminder that the successful challenges to Zionism have come from direct action, close quote. According to SJP's stated goal, Zionism can, quote, be broken down and dismantled, close quote. Most importantly, however, SJP explained that at the conference, they would not just talk theory, but rather they would also, quote, focus on developing actionable local and regional campaigns with clear targets, close quote. So I ask you, if you are a student group that equates Zionism with, quote, ethnic cleansing, destruction, mass expulsion, apartheid, and death, and your group's stated goal is to, quote, destroy and, quote, dismantle Zionism. And you plan to develop, quote, actionable local and regional campaigns with clear targets. I ask you, who are your targets? Pro-Israel Zionists. And what do those campaigns look like? They look like what we saw last year at New York University when 53 student organizations representing the entire progressive community on campus pledged not only to support BDS and to boycott Israel, but to also boycott the pro-Israel student groups on campus. Meaning, they said they would not engage with or dialogue with or co-sponsor events with the pro-Israel students. What message does that convey to, pro, to a pro-Israel student at NYU? It's saying to that student, if you want to join our campus community, if you want to be a full-fledged member and demonstrate with us on climate change, women's rights, LGBT rights, we'll accept you on one condition. Check your support for Israel at the door. Shed that part of your Jewish identity and you can join us. That's no different than demanding that a student stop observing Shabbat or stop keeping kosher in order to gain admission. It's comparable to demanding that a Catholic student disavow the Vatican or a Muslim student shed his or her connection to Mecca. Excluding an individual in this manner on the basis of his or her identity is discrimination. This discriminatory conduct is spreading beyond the college campuses. Not long ago, here in Washington, D.C., at the D.C. Dyke March, Organizers of the march informed Jewish participants that they could wear religious paraphernalia such as a kippah or a talit, but items that express support for Israel, such as the Jewish pride flag, a rainbow flag with a star of David in the middle, were prohibited. 
The Dyke March leaders, who controlled access to a march designed to celebrate diversity and inclusion, were demanding that Jewish Zionists hide or shed a key component of their Jewish identity in order to participate. No other group was charged such a high price for admission. Our laws are designed to protect individuals from harassment and discrimination. The law does not protect you from an opinion you find offensive. In the United States, even hate speech is protected speech. So if we want to effectively utilize our legal tools, such as Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, we must accurately articulate what is happening as harassment and discrimination. If we fail to do this, we won't be able to use the tools in our toolbox. If we permit administrators in university, on university campuses and the general public to perceive the situation as merely a political disagreement, where each side takes offense at the other side's position, then we disable our most potent weapon. Ostracizing, marginalizing, and excluding pro-Israel Zionists on the basis of their identity is not a speech issue. It is racist and unlawful conduct and must be confronted as such. Students must understand that what they are experiencing is anti-Semitism and that the law can protect them. We have to teach students and parents how to utilize the law effectively to combat Zionophobia and anti-Semitism. We must educate our children so that they don't ally themselves with groups that deny Jews the right to self-determination or deny Jews the right to express the Zionist part of their Jewish identity. It is imperative that the public understand that this denial is racist, discriminatory, and anti-Semitic, whether it comes from non-Jews or Jews. During our panel discussion, I hope to share with you steps that the Brandeis Center is taking to address these issues and change the climate on campus and beyond. Because if we want to ensure that history does not repeat itself, we must recognize that if you isolate and dehumanize Zionists and claim that they represent society's greatest evil, then you are branding Jews with a virtual yellow star of David. And then what comes next? Thank you. Thank you. My name is William Jacobson. I'm a professor at Cornell Law School. I'm also the founder and chief author at Legal Insurrection website, which has covered campus issues specifically with regard to anti-Semitism and the BDS movement almost daily since 2008. I'm going to discuss today intersectionality. It's a word that Attorney General Barr mentioned in his introduction this morning and it is a very hot topic on campuses. I'm going to discuss how it was originally formulated, how it has developed into the intellectual justification for the isolation of Jewish students on campus and Zionist Jews in the progressive movement. Um, I only have a short time today, so there's a limited amount of detail that I can go into, but I'll also hope to bring uh, to this presentation my experiences interacting with students, both uh, on my campus and many other campuses. The, you've heard two very excellent speeches so far, presentations so far, and the big takeaway that you need from this presentation and the other presentations is the isolation of Jewish students on campus because that is the goal, that is the methodology, and that is the single biggest problem that we face. Uh, the statements that have been made so far comport with my experiences interacting with students. Uh, I started my website in 2008 and began covering the BDS movement almost immediately. But it really wasn't until the 2010-2013 time frame that BDS took off in a serious way on campuses. And at that time, there weren't many major Jewish or pro-Israel organizations on the ground in campuses, so I often served and my website served as a first responder to students who were seeking help. And we did that. And again, it was that sense of isolation, the sense that they were being ganged up on, was my big takeaway from those interactions. <coughs> um, the term in, um, intersectionality 
is a very loosely used term nowadays. It's kind of like social justice. It's, it's a buzzword. <clears throat> it has become something of the Swiss army knife of progressive campus politics, and it's far removed from its origins. It's often described in conservative media as victim Olympics, the ordering of victim status based on various identity politics classifications, but that's only a part of it, and that's perhaps more the popular press part of it. Intersectionality provides the intellectual framework and justification for people who would not consider themselves anti-Semitic or even necessarily seek the destruction of Israel, nonetheless to isolate Jewish students. The term, it's, a, a, a toxic, it's become a toxic mixture of racial and identity politics where anti-Zionism is the unifying feature among many groups who otherwise have very little in common. It didn't start this way. The term intersectionality is widely credited to a 1989 article by my law school classmate, Kimberly Crenshaw, who at the time was a law professor at UCLA and recently also is at Columbia. As originally authored, the concept of intersectionality was meant to address the unique problems in her perspective that black women faced in obtaining justice in the judicial system, that the sex discrimination laws addressed discrimination against women and the race discrimination laws uh, addressed the uh, discrimination against minorities, particularly blacks, but in her estimation, none of those laws and none of those legal analyses adequately addressed people, in her uh, article, black women, who were at the intersection of multiple identities which were suffering. So in, in her words, uh, she termed intersectionality as something, as a way of pr looking at from a judicial and uh, discrimination law perspective, how to better liberate, if you will, black women from those two forces of sex discrimination and race discrimination that they uniquely uh, suffered that, in her words, black men did not suffer and white women did not suffer because they did not have that intersecting uh, identity. Whether you accept this framework or not, there's nothing about intersectionality as originally framed that involves politics or involves Israel. It was a way of looking at how the courts deal with discrimination against people who are in multiple classifications of protected groups. It was. Uh, Yet along the way, intersectionality became a buzzword divorced from this original meaning. A 2017 critique in the Chronicle of Higher Education noted that the word has migrated from women's studies journals and conference keynotes into everyday conversation, turning what was once highbrow discourse into hashtag chatter. Nowhere has the expansion of and politicization of intersectionality been more aggressive and destructive than in the anti-Zionist movement, including the Jewish anti-Zionist movement. Uh, Anti-Israel academics and activists have seized on intersectionality as a means of building coalitions of quote unquote people of color against Israel, which is portrayed as a white colonialist enterprise with the goal of isolating Jews who support Israel's right to exist, which of course is the overwhelming majority of Jews. It's hard to pinpoint precisely when this happened, but certainly the Durban conference and the um, goal of bringing race into the attack on Israel, terming Israel an apartheid state, comparing it to South Africa, has turned intersectionality into not just a judicial philosophy or ju judicial approach, but an approach to demonizing Israel and launching the boycott, divestment, and, and sanctions movement against Israel. And you see that terminology used repeatedly uh, it, by the anti-Israel left anti-Israel progressive movement, particularly anti-Israel progressive Jews, on campuses. In January 2016, the Jewish Voice for Peace student network issued a statement on intersectionality, which read in part, we are committed to support the Palestinian struggle against Israeli occupation, apartheid, and racism, which is bound up with our analysis of its intersection with the struggle of students of color. 
anti-Jewish bigotry is not equivalent to the structural oppression experienced by students of color. And this is what you hear every day on campuses where they put together coalitions of students of color, non-white student groups, and they try to use that to isolate pro-Israel students and Zionist students. We've seen it multiple times at Cornell. In 2014, there was a BDS resolution introduced to the student government, which didn't get very far. It was tabled before open discussion. But in 2019, that was renewed. And the organizers spent, by their own estimation, two years building a coalition of students. So when they introduced the resolution, uh, there were 20 or 25 uh, students representing virtually every non-white identity group on campus who were endorsing the resolution, uh, the boycott resolution against Israel. And it was presented that if you want to be supportive of students of color, you must endorse this. And if you object to the BDS movement, you are hostile to racial minorities. And that's just one example that we're seeing on campuses. There are many others. Perhaps we can get into some of those during the discussion and I'm certainly happy to speak with people afterwards. Thank you. So, uh, so it does not, do you know how to work this? I think Lindsay is, is trying to work it. Uh, you're trying to work it? Okay, so now I can... Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, members of uh, the various departments of the U.S. government, Special Envoy Carr, distinguished communal leaders from the Jewish community, it's an honor to be here. And today I'm going to discuss a research project that ISGAP is engaged in. ISGAP is the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. We're an academic research center, uh, but fell into this subject uh, in an interesting way about seven years ago. I'm happy to be joined uh, by Michael Bass. Michael Bass is a CPA and was a key figure in this seven-year project that we engaged in at ISGAP of Follow the Money. And I worked with uh, Michael and our colleague Glenn Fetter on this project. Elie Wiesel said that we're living in a time of great urgency. And then he went on to correct himself and he said, no, we're not living in a great time of urgency. We're living in a time of an emergency. And he said this in 2003. So from 2003 to this moment, we know that things are becoming significant. He also always taught that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. That once this form of hatred is unleashed upon society, it knows no boundaries and attacks not only the Jews, but other par parts of the population, other citizens, and the very democratic institutions and practices that we hold on to. Tragically, I'm sad to report, as my colleagues have also referred to, that the universities are actually becoming a purveyor of anti-Semitism. The very institution that is perhaps the most important for the continuation of democratic principles, educating the next generation, is the space in which anti-Semitism is being uh, purveyed. This project came upon us uh, in an interesting way. One of the vice presidents of a top Ivy League university apparently worked for a pharmaceutical company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This pharmaceutical company in Cambridge, Massachusetts was owned by Salam Ahmed bin Mahfouz a known person that was not only in favor of the BDS, but also had connections to terror. The vice president of this university actually hired an assistant who worked right here in Washington with none other than Abdul Rahman Al-Moudi. Al and we, for those who study these issues, we know of their connections not only to anti-Semitism and political Islam, not Islam, not Muslims, but political reactionary um, Islam, political Islam, um, that they also had connections to terror. And it was these 
sort of network in this university that not only promoted uh, anti-Semitism and political Islam and the demonization of Jewish peoplehood in Israel, but also promoted political Islam within the university. Thanks to this, and I started to do research on my own and then in a few months worked with Michael. Michael Bass uh, gave a lot of his time and energy. A lot of these findings are his. Most of these findings are his. And Michael, for seven years, has combed through various sources of information, all open source, from the Department of Education and other government branches, looking at funding. And we can see here in this document that U.S. colleges with Middle East Studies departments uh, are receiving massive amount of funding from the Gulf states. What's interesting in our research and the most important element in our research that's probably missing is that there are many multinational companies, large corporations in the United States, domestic companies in the United States that are also funneling lots of money, billions of money into, the, into American universities. And this is a sort of a, a hole that needs to be understood. Here, this is a very important document. Groups like the Middle East Forum and other groups researching the funding of U.S. universities by the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islamists have discovered 300 million. Some are now speaking about 1.4 million. Our research shows that we have accounted for $1.9 billion going to American universities. And what's fascinating is the un undocumented report, the amount that's not been reported. That, re that amount is almost $3 billion that we found. And given our lack of resources, although we try very hard and we work diligently, <coughs> given our limited resources to put into this project and our expertise, if we can find $3 billion that is unaccountable, unaccounted for, imagine what is going on. It's interesting that Texas A&M, for example, their budget, they have a report, they did not report over $750 million. And their budget and the funding from Qatar always match up in Michael's research. The Qatari Foundation, as we know, is run by or, and, or heavily influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood. In the memory presentation, our colleague from memory, he ran a clip that I was going to run, which shows Yosef Kawadawi, the, the, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, literally calling for all believers, all true believers, to finish the work of Hitler. This is where the money is coming from. Yosef Kawadawi, for example, played an integral role in founding Islamic studies at Oxford. So imagine how these ideologies are infiltrating into universities. Here we can see some of the findings here. From, these are from the universities in Doha City. Based on our research, I think it would be a very fair assumption to show that a, a ton of funds are coming from the campuses in Doha into the United States of America proper. That this is an extraordinary finding thanks to the work of Michael Bass. So here we go. I would like to very briefly, I know I'm running out of time, that we want, I would like to present some uh, other findings. For example, Yale University received a $10 million gift from Dr. Abdal, uh, from Abdallah Salam uh, Kamel for the Yale Law School. He offered publicly $10 million. $100,000 has been reported by Yale University to the Department of Education. Yale University has only reported approximately $2 million, even though they received over $150 million from the world since from 1983 to 2018, sorry, from the Middle East. Um, very quickly, recommendations. We argue vehemently there needs to be an improvement of the reporting mechanisms to the Department of Education from gifts from foreign sources and also domestic sources tighter controls of who is reporting and what they should be reporting in, in general. Um, inconsistencies of the Department of Education from, of, by colleges on foreign operations. Why did Texas A&M only begin to report 
their donations in the last two years. Um, should uh, colleges accept anonymous gifts? This is legal. The law says the country needs to be shown, the country of origin of a gift needs to be shown, but not the source. So it's very easy for countries or individuals or, co or non-profit organizations or governments to use another country as the origin of their gift to American universities. We call upon the government to try to use the IRA definition of anti-Semitism to conduct academic, and uh, academic affairs at the student level, the academic level, and at the administration level. We call upon all relevant branches of the government, all departments with a stake in the future of our education system and the future of our democracy to engage in a, in a systematic investigation of the funding of American universities by not only anti-Semitic sources, but, but anti-democratic sources. We also call for an investigation into the, the atmosphere on campus. We're talking about here the administration, what's taking place in the classroom, but we know from my other colleagues, the Students for Justice in Palestine, CARE, the Muslim Student Association, have been disturbing the atmosphere on campus. Stu Jewish students are experiencing anti-Semitism at alarming rates, at much higher rates than women experience uh, or, or witness sexism, and African Americans witness or experience racism. The statistics are off the chart, and there's a huge discrepancy on age. Older, American, old, older Jewish Americans do not experience anti-Semitism at the same level as young Jewish Americans. And we believe, in, in closing, that the $6.5 billion that this research project at ISGAP, through the work of Michael Bass, discovered has to be the tip of an iceberg. And if this is the tip of an iceberg, we call for a proper investigation of American universities and the funding and the funders of hate that is now permeating our, our most precious institution in our democracy, the education system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of our panelists. Those were extremely thought-provoking comments um, and give rise to a number of questions, at least for me. The um, kind of three sets of questions occur to me. One set centers around what is the phenomenon. One set is where does the phenomenon come from and what the third set is what can be done. So maybe, maybe we'll turn to that first set first. So a number of the, of the comments focused on um, anti-Semitism as filtered through anti-Zionist movements um, and you know, Ms. Lewin, I thought very interestingly, contrasted it with, you know, what we think of as traditional or classical anti-Semitism, so swastikas, violence, um, you know, discrimination against Jewish students. Are we also seeing that kind of anti-Semitism? Are you, um, I, this side of the table is probably well situated to talk about that from time on campus, but, but I'd love to hear from, from anyone who has thoughts on whether we're seeing that, that side of the anti-Semitism too, and whether it's also on the rise. Uh, my experience and observations is that what we typically call uh, right-wing anti-Semitism, things like that, are mostly anecdotal on campuses. There might be a swastika sticker painted. Of course, we don't, in most cases, know who painted it. Um, uh, but those tend to be on campuses anecdotal. Whereas the anti-Semitism from the left and the Islamist anti-Semitism is more systematic, more pervasive, more organized, and more supported by faculty. Uh, a lot of the anti-Zionism on campuses and a lot of the isolation of students on campuses comes under the leadership of faculty, and that's just a reality. Uh, they are the thought leaders. They are the ones who have a continuing presence on campus. So uh, in my experience, not to say that there haven't been specific horrible instances of right-wing anti-Semitism on campuses, but that is not the pervasive problem. It is more the uh, anti-Semitism masking itself as anti-Zionism that is a pervasive problem, in my experience and observation. I'd like to say, I think, you know, in an earlier panel which touched on the questions of free speech, the problem here isn't that people come to campuses and say offensive things about Israel, or bad things about Jews even. The problem is when such beliefs, whether anti-Zionist, BDS, are institutionalized within colleges themselves. That takes partly the role of where 
curricula and faculty are prom actively promoting anti-Zionism, actively making Jewish students in classes, never mind in, in, in campus clubs, feel marginalized. It's tough enough, as we know in this, in this city, to speak truth to power under any circumstances. It's unreasonable to expect students to speak truth to power to the people who control their grades. It just doesn't work that way. And it also takes the form of privileging anti-Semitic anti agitation in the form of anti-Zionism on college campuses when student groups not merely enact, uh, debate and enact BDS resolutions, although fortunately in, on most campuses those resolutions have been defeated. But in the course of discourse, where Jewish students are served with fake eviction notices to highlight what they, you know, false claims about Israeli practices, where Israeli apartheid weeks and apartheid walls depicting Israeli Israel's measures of security against terrorism are made specifically to make Jewish students uncomfortable, to make it, to make it impossible for them to speak up for Israel and to retain their standing on campus as people of goodwill. That's the problem, where universities prioritize and allow these events to go forward in a way in which they would not allow other student groups to be victimized in this way. That's the problem, not speech. Just to build on that too, um, the AMCHA initiative, Tammy Rossman Benjamin actually did a study at one point. And while yes, there is certainly the more traditional anti-Semitism on campus, what you find is that what resonates, what Im impacts the students the most, where they feel the marginalization, the hostility, the fear, the isol isolation, is more in the anti-Zionism context. And what's happening, as I was trying to explain, is that you have students for whom this is a part of what it means to them to be Jewish. And what they're being told is, if you want to belong, if you want to be accepted, if you want to function on this campus, you have to either hide or shed that part of who you are. And I, I mean, you could, people have an easier time understanding it if you, for example, had a university which had created a climate where homosexuals felt uncomfortable coming out of the closet because they felt that they would be isolated, marginalized, ostracized. That's what you have now with Zionists on campus. They feel they can't live in their own skin. And is your view that, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to comment. I think there's also backing up, I think what Tammy's, uh, Tammy Benjamin's research at AMCHA uh, demonstrates, and now our research project also, I think, augments and reinforces your research, is that we found that funding from uh, of Middle East Studies centers at American universities, where that is taking place and where this, this type of funding that we alluded to here or mentioned here takes place, that where there's Students for Justice in Palestine plus funding, foreign funding with Middle East Studies Center, there is more activities, anti-Semitic activity on campus affecting students and scholars. Um, and I think we also have to realize that the, the, the pressure on not just students not just students finishing degrees or PhDs or faculty entering into the university and trying to get um, permanent positions and then tenure. There's tremendous pressure um, not to be perceived as too Zionist or too pro-Israel because of the atmosphere on campus. And we call this sort of the red-green alliance, the extreme so-called left. I think that the left has actually abandoned a left-wing agenda, but we'll put that issue aside. But the, the extreme green, the, the Islamists and the extreme left have sort of entered into this anti-Semitic uh, and sort of unholy alliance. They're both opposed to Western hegemony. They're both, both opposed to Zionism and American neo-colonialism. That's sort of the rhetoric of this ideology. And though diametrically opposed to everything else uh, in this worldview, they are united in their anti-Semitism and their anti-Zionism. And this gives cover for a lot of uh, difficult uh, situations, uh, atmospheres on campus, and a whole generation learning at the best universities that Israel is somewhat, somehow, at, at the very least, a problem to something that needs to either be uh, reformed or even destroyed. And this is mainstream education, which is f fueling uh, general anti-Semitism. And what are you seeing in terms of 
patterns and prevalence in terms of geography, in terms of kinds of schools? Is it small liberal arts schools where you see it more? Is it, is it larger schools that have Middle East centers? If you, were, if you were a parent, for example, who wanted to send your child or encourage your child to attend a university where they were less likely to face anti-Semitism, what would you be looking for? So I, I would say, you know, what I tell my students that I'm Jewish because my mother's Jewish. That's why I'm Jewish. Um, but when we live in a democracy, Every generation has to stand up and not only protect democracy, but expand its influence. So I, I would say it's not a question of finding the safe school. I think it's a question of, for, for all the communities who care about human rights, the rights of Jews, the rights of women, the rights of gendered identity people, the rights of religious minorities, Christians, Copts, Yazdis, Kurds. If you care about basic human rights and democratic principles, I think we as a generation and we have, as a society needs to stand up and protect our education system because if we lose it, we're in serious trouble. The frightening fact is that this is not restricted to certain types of universities and it's not restricted to just universities. The dehumanizing of Zionists now is, a, uh, a, is becoming mainstreamed and it, is, it may have started and we may see it uh, really egregiously on the campuses, but it's moving beyond. That's what I said. We now see it in, in our daily lives outside of campuses. Yeah, I, I'd like to add that um, there's no way to restrict this to one kind. I mean, certainly there's a lot of anti-Zionist activity at my alma mater, Columbia. You could note other famous liberal arts college where that's true. But the problem is, is that wherever Middle East studies is taught, uh, those departments have become the the, the, uh, the bailiwick of anti-Zionists who spread some of these negative attitudes uh, and these, these really false ideas about Jews and about Israel. And that's really tough to combat. So it, it gets to the point, uh, sometimes I think all of us on this panel are asked, well, how do we prepare young Jews to face this kind of dilemma? And yes, they have to know the facts, they have to know, you know what's, what are myths, what are wrong, they have to be armed with the, the information. But the truth is, when faced with this kind of a situation, we have to start with one, um, one, one quality that would resonate for those who grew up in the era of the Soviet Jewry movement, and that is the courage to speak up. That's the hardest thing. It's hard for people in, in general society. It's hard for those of us who even do this for a living. But it's really hard for students. And yet that is, those are the qualities that I think those of us who are, who are involved in, in this fight have to model. And it, quite frankly, it's the message that the United States government, the Department of Justice, and everywhere has to send out that you have to have the courage to speak up for what is right and against hateful stereotypes that seek to target Jews. So I'm just going to build on that. It maybe goes towards your third question, which is one of the things that we are doing at the Brandeis Center is we are training our law students because we realize that the undergraduates, not only do you need to know the history, the information, but you need to understand your legal rights. And undergraduates don't understand, they don't know their legal rights, and they don't call lawyers. So what we decided to do is train law students to be able to work with the undergraduates, to give them that confidence, to give them that courage to speak up. And we've created essentially a curriculum which gives them a little bit of the First Amendment uh, law. It gives them information about academic freedom and about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act so that they can then turn around and go, we call it Jigsaw, our justice initiative guiding student activists worldwide. And that's what we do on the student end to try and help the undergraduates have that confidence and then give them the ability to articulate and describe what's happening and how the discrimination is taking place on campus so that we can then use the legal tools we have. And then we're also, on the administrative side, putting together what we call guidelines, essentially guidelines for the university administrators, explaining to them so that they can understand and see and comprehend what's really happening on the campuses so that they understand how this is an attack on Zionists, not Jews, but Zionists, and how this is isolating and, and ostracizing Zionists and denying them their, a place in their society on campus. And we are putting together guidelines with actual concrete steps that universities can take to try and address the situation. And one of the first things that I think they could do is there was in the lawsuit that was brought against San Francisco State University 
uh, by the Lawfare Project, they settled that case. But one of the first items in the settlement was a requirement that the university issue a statement recognizing that Zionism is a key part of the identity of many of the students on their campus. The truth is, all universities ought to be issuing that kind of statement. They ought to be issuing that kind of statement in order to give the confidence and the courage to the students on campus to know that they can express that part of their identity, that the university supports them in expressing that part of their identity, and that they shouldn't feel intimidated or that they have to hide or shed that part of who they are. Yeah, I think the, the question was, uh, where is this most prevalent? And I, I'm not sure there's any identifying theme, but it certainly is true that many of, most of this activity or much of the activity takes place at uh, a relatively small number of elite institutions. Uh, so that's the good news. We're talking about, we're not talking about out of whatever the 2,000 institutions of higher education, we're not talking about 1,900 where this is a problem. But where it is a problem tend to be the elite ones which form our opinion makers, our opinion shapers, um, and have it uh, get reported in the New York Times, get reported in the Washington Post, have an outsized influence on the greater culture. And just running through the list of Jewish Voice for Priests students uh, groups who signed that 2016 uh, statement on intersectionality, essentially saying that Jews don't get to participate in that, um, Columbia, Vassar, um, Wisconsin, Wesleyan, Berkeley, Claremont, UCLA, U Chicago, U Michigan, uh, at Ann Arbor, um, and Illinois, Champaign, Urbana. I mean, these are elite institutions, and that's been my experience. It's, it's worse, and in terms of where you're going to send your, your children, I get that question all the time. Um, I, I think you need to look into it, and you need to investigate the campus culture, and you need to see what, how the administration has reacted to things, um, and you need to understand that because if you're going to send your child to a small 2,000 student school, which is, um, you know, taken by anti-Israel fervor, there's not a lot of support systems there, and there's not a lot of places to find their own space. Um, whereas if you send them to a, a larger institution, there may be other communities. So I think you need to do your research just like you would do the research on which school has the best chemistry department or anything else. It's amazing how much time people will spend going over those things, but won't look into the culture as it relates to whether a Jewish student can express his or her identity on campus. So do your research, but clearly there are some more problematic campuses than others. And I just want to add, I, I agree with everything, but also I think we have to take note that the, the public and intellectual discourse, even now in the United States, has shifted. Anti-Semitic tropes that were once unimaginable, unimaginable that they would be gracing the most uh, important sort of media of record, or even in our most important institutions in our democracy, that those tropes are now being discussed on a regular basis. The fact that the public discourse has shifted so much in such a short period of time, I think reflects on the issues of education, what people are learning in universities, and the threat that we now face in the universities and now even in our institutions of government and in the public debate in the media of record. And I just came from the United Kingdom. There are several years, I think, ahead of us here in the United States, but the situation is, is grave in the UK. It's teetering on perhaps a momentous decision in the next six to eight months about a new prime minister that is um, having these views of, in the Red-Green Alliance on his understanding of what Israel is and what the Jewish people are and what Zionists are. It's alive and well in an old, important democracy. And that rhetoric is here. And that should serve as a tremendous warning to all of us in this room. So, what, so several people have brought up the, the concept of administrators and what administrators should be doing to address this problem. And it's, it's not, I think, an, an altogether intuitive or easy question, just because I think we are in a place probably where all of us think that robust discussion on campus and academic freedom are important uh, are important values, right? And as Ms. Lewin said, we don't have hate speech, you know, barring sort of incitement to violence, we don't have hate speech laws in our country. Some, some in, in public universities, administrators are, 
are state actors, right? So there are First Amendment issues, not to go back to the, the first panel, but in, in, in private universities, that's not true. But so how should a, an administration be deft in addressing these problems? Is it, is it by being a speaker in the debate? Is it by being a regulator of speech? Is it by being a regulator of conduct? Um, what is working and what is not working? I think what doesn't work is when university administrators assume a stance of neutrality about hate speech directed at Jews on their campuses. That has happened all too often. Um, we go back a decade to what happened at the University of California in Irvine, which was a much discussed case. The Brandeis Institute did, did a lot of good work on it. But the message that came through was that the university just washed its hands of incidents that actually led to violence against Jews. And I might say, sadly, the, the administration of the time similarly washed its hands of, of, of the issue and wouldn't prosecute or wouldn't, you know, wouldn't take it seriously. It has to be, it cannot, you know, we're, we're not asking them to suppress the speech of those with whom we disagree. We're asking them to speak up as they would on any other human rights or issue concerning discrimination against any other group and say, no, this is not what our university stands for. This is opposed to the values of, of free inquiry and, and what we're supposed to be. And if they fail to do that, then, then it's just a green light for things to escalate. And that's why we talk about, uh, about instances where Jewish students feel marginalized, shunned, silenced. It happens, you know, it, it starts from the leadership. I think that's right. I think the key is that the university has to start condemning anti-Semitic um, incidents and speech the way they would condemn racist speech, not shut it down, right? What is the difference? If you were to have a, a major demonstration in the public square, um, or you have a major demonstration on campus, and it is filled with the most vile, racist, anti-Semitic rhetoric, what's the difference legally, right? The speech is equally protected in both places. But if it takes place in the public square, the government actually has no obligation to say anything about the nature of that speech. That's one of the beauties of our First Amendment, is you can say it, and it doesn't matter if it's racist, you can say it. Um, but if it happens on the university campus, Title VI does put certain requirements on the universities. They can't ignore it. And the problem that we're seeing today is that they'll condemn the racist speech, but they don't condemn the anti-Semitic speech. And part of the problem is because they seem to have a difficult time getting their heads around what is anti-Semitic speech when it comes to the attacks on Zionism. And that's why I think it doesn't have to be so complicated. The key issue, the crux of the issue is whether or not you support the right of Jewish self-determination. That has to be the question. That, as Judea Pearl said, Zionophobia. If it's Zionophobia, it's anti-Semitic, and that needs to be condemned. That's what you need to teach and educate the administrators. Because once that gets condemned on campus, the way racist speech is condemned on campus, your Zionist will feel a little bit more protected. Can I, can I add? Uh, so I would also like to add the First Amendment, of course, is essential, and we shouldn't be squashing uh, freedom of expression, academic freedom. But just by a show of hands, how many, is a, how many people here ever read Kutub or Al-Bana? A few. So Kutub and Al-Bana are the founding intellectuals of the Muslim Brotherhood. So if we're going to protect the First Amendment and the Constitution as we should, we have to educate ourselves and become fluent and literate on, on the mind of our enemy and what's at stake. The Muslim Brotherhood, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, took the protocols of the elders of Zion, they took anti-Semitism, which was a European phenomenon, not a phenomenon, there was discrimination against Jews in the Islamic world for sure, but not anti-Semitism, which is inherently genocidal and emanates from Europe. It was imported by various processes that I won't go into, adopted by the Muslim Brotherhood, they took their version, their narrow version of Islam and fused it with um, European anti-Semitism and created this sort of reactionary social movement. It advocates the extermination of the Jews. It takes the protocols of the elders of Zion, the most pernicious forms of European anti-Semitism, at the core of its ideology. It's not the military wing, it's not the extremists. Yosef Kawadawi in these clips didn't wake up in a bad mood. This is at the core of their ideology. So if we're going to confront it, we have to become fluent and literate in this ideology and understand how to confront it. And I think 
the founding fathers of, of this nation, like Jefferson, warned that, it's, that the citizens need to be educated to protect the democracy. And I think this is a very much a threat to our democratic principles and not just to the Jewish community on campus. In terms of uh, the question about whether what role should administrators play, I certainly don't think they should be the regulators of speech. Uh, all I think we should be demanding, and it seems to be a lot for administrators, is equal treatment and equal enforcement of whatever rules and regulations you, they have. You could make the argument that a private institution should be able to regulate student speech, and many institutions have speech codes. Whether you're for that or you're against that is one issue. But if you are going to have those codes, they should be enforced not, they should be enforced not just against people who engage in what would be termed racist speech or homophobic speech, but also anti-Semitic anti speech. Again, you could make the argument they shouldn't have those at all, but they do. And what we see and what the problem is, is having made a decision to have that sort of regulation of speech and conduct, it is not equally and fairly enforced. And that's where I think the focus needs to be because I would argue that the administration in a more ideal world should do nothing other than preserve the free marketplace for ideas on campus and the free marketplace for speech. One of the biggest problems we have is almost any Israeli speaker is going to get disrupted and shouted down on a U.S. campus, and many pro-Israel speakers will get shouted down and disrupted. <clears throat> and the schools need to preserve the ability of pro-Israel students to get their speakers on campus, and they need to enforce their codes, which don't permit, in most cases, cases the preventing others from speaking. So I think that in a better world, we would have administrators have fewer regulations, not more, but to the extent they do have regulations, enforce them equally. <coughs> I also just want to say, I think we need to educate the administrators to be able to distinguish between the groups that genuinely want coexistence. And so the dialogue that needs to be fostered on the campus and encouraged on the campus is the dialogue, like you were saying, that you see the Israelis engaging in all the time, the dialogue about the actual policies, not the demonization of the Zionists, not the Zionophobic conversation, which is just denying the Jews their right to their self-determination in their ancestral homeland. Once you can make that distinction, then you can in encourage constructive dialogue on campus as opposed to the type of speech that may be taking place that is anti-Semitic and that just seeks to ostracize and isolate the Zionists. So why, why now? Why is there a particular problem now? And I, I understand that part of what people have said is that there are organized efforts, um, whether through funding or through um, particular anti-Zionist movements that are pushing um, certain ideologies and certain actions. Are, is there a reason that all that is happening now? Is it, does it have to do with current events in foreign policy? Does it have to do with um, the sort of state of religiosity in our country? Like what are there, are there, is it just accidental that things are arising now? I think this issue is bigger than just campuses. It's actually bigger than just what's going on in this country. We're talking about a rising tide of anti-Semitism that is sweeping over the globe. We are some 74 years since uh, the end of World War II, uh, the Holocaust. Its memory has dimmed clearly in Europe and elsewhere. Things that were unimaginable a few dec decades ago are now imaginable. And as we've said, things that were not part of the dialogue, things that you would never expect to see in the New York Times just 20 years ago, you see there on a regular basis arguments. Things are debatable that didn't used to be debatable. And part of it is, is you know, it, it, this complex virus. The great scholar Ruth Weiss spoke of anti-Semitism being the most successful ideology of the 20th century because it had morphed and attached itself to a number of ideologies, fascism, Nazism, communism, and then radical Islam. All have come, now we're in a moment when radical Islam is, is spreading, when it has, there is this strange alliance, especially in Europe, between radical Islamists and left-wing elites who both share a, a, a hatred for Israel and create an atmosphere in which 
Jews are marginalized. Um, fortunately, we live in a country where that is not mainstream dialogue, but the one place where it is mainstream is on college campuses, and that's why we're dealing with this issue. And if I can just pick up briefly with what Jonathan said, and it's very important, I think like the totalitarian movements of the past where the Jew was the quintessential you know, boogeyman or the other, and the focus was to put, be put on the Jew, on their business practices, how they stick together, their, you know, their, their culture, their race. It was focusing on the Jew while the totalitarians tried to take over and uh, dominate society. So political Islam is doing the same thing. It's focusing on the Israelis, focusing on the Zionists, focusing on the Jew, and while everybody's looking over here and, and, and is afraid to speak out against it, which is problematic in and of itself, while everybody's focused on the Zionist, the Israeli, and the Jew, look at what's happening in the world. You could even make an argument that contemporary anti-Semitism's greatest victim are Muslims, Muslims in the Middle East who are engaged in horrible conflicts uh, throughout the region. So everybody focuses on Netanyahu, the Zionists, and the Israelis, and the Jews, and we're distracted from the real human rights catastrophe that is taking place as we speak. So again, the totalitarians use the Jew as a scapegoat while there's very serious issues to be addressed. I think the issue of why does it seem to be getting worse on campuses does have to do uh, in part with our domestic political situation where um, anti-conservative, anti-republican, and anti-Trump politics on campuses has come to dominate. Um, and the issue of support for Israel um, has gotten intertwined with that. Uh, I think there's no denying that. Uh, and certainly among the student activist groups, those two have become intertwined. So if you want to um, bring everybody together on campus, um, you combine um, anti-Israel politics with anti-Trump politics, um, and you automatically have a coalition of you know, a large percentage of the student activist groups. And so I think there is something to that, uh, whether that's accurate, whether it's justified as a different discussion, but I think that is a phenomenon that's going on on the campuses where anti-Trump politics um, has been exploited by anti-Israel groups as a way of building coalitions. And I think that's why things do seem to be accelerating in the past couple of years. I, I do think that this is, the reason why now is that this is the modern evolution of the world's oldest hatred of anti-Semitism. Um, as Erwin Cutler once said, the traditional anti-Semitism sought to deny the Jew his place in society. This new anti-Semitism is seeking to deny the Jewish collective, the state of Israel, its place in the society of nations. Yossi Klein Halevi at one point put it really well. He was talking about how the way anti-Semitism works is that it turns the Jew into the symbol, and this is what I think Charles was saying too, and what everybody here has been saying, is that the Jew becomes the symbol of whatever it is that at that point civilization defines as its most, most loathsome qualities. So he said that uh, under Christianity and before the Holocaust, the Jew was the Christ killer. Uh, during um, the Nazis, the Jew was the race polluter. Um, for you know, the Jew under communism, the Jew was the capitalist. And now, what do we see in our civilization today? Well, we live in a civilization where, as, and this is again Yossi Klein Alevi quote, he says, the most loathsome qualities are racism, colonialism, apartheid. And lo and behold, the greatest offender in the world today with all the beautiful countries in the world is the Jewish state, and that's why we have what's happening now, today. Well, I'd like to, I, I was hoping to end on a slightly more, uh, a higher note than, <laughs> 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 but, but maybe the higher note to end on is that there are uh, thoughtful, smart people who are thinking about this and who are engaged in the problem and that it is not going unseen. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists for, for being here today and for their thoughtful remarks. <laughs>
Information regarding kosher options in the area is available on the registration table in the back. Non-kosher options are available in the Justice Cafe and escorts are available to assist you. Please leave yourself enough time to be back in your seats and clear security uh, at 2 p.m. when we'll promptly reconvene at 2 p.m.